Just after sunset over Louisville, a UPS cargo jet roared down the runway, three engines at full power, 220,000 pounds of fuel on board. Seconds later, it was gone. The MD-11 lifted, briefly rolled hard, and slammed into a line of warehouses beyond the airport fence. 14 lives lost, and a city in flames. This was UPS Flight 2976, a fully certified long-haul freighter built to keep flying even if one engine failed. But on this night, it didn't just lose one. Within moments, two engines were crippled. So how does a jet designed for redundancy end up powerless over its own airport? Let's break it down. From the cockpit's point of view, this night starts like hundreds of others. They line up on the runway in Louisville with a fully fueled MD-11 bound for Hawaii. Long leg heavy airplane, roughly 34,000 gallons of fuel on board, close to their maximum takeoff weight. You can think of it like trying to launch a fully loaded freight train into the sky once you commit, there's a lot of momentum and very little room for error. As they start the takeoff roll, the thrust levers go full forward and the aircraft begins accelerating. In the cockpit, one of the key speeds they're watching for is called V1. V1 is the go or no-go speed, the point where if something happens, there isn't enough runway left to safely stop. Before V1, you can reject the takeoff, pull the power to idle brake hard and stay on the ground. After V1, you are committed to fly even if you lose an engine. That's how every commercial pilot is trained. Somewhere between V1 and the next critical call, rotate things start to go very wrong. In the available videos, when we slow them down and look frame by frame, we see two things on the left side where engine number one should be. We see intense fire and eventually a complete absence of the engine. On the right side from engine number three, we see brief flashes of flame that are characteristic of a compressor stall that's a violent disruption of airflow inside a jet engine. The aircraft does manage to lift off. Reports and data suggest it only climbs to somewhere between perhaps 100 and at most a few hundred feet above the ground. That might sound like a lot, but in a heavy jet, that is nothing. You're still over the airport boundary fence with buildings, wires, and structures directly ahead. This is not a slow accident on landing with time and altitude to work the problem. This is a takeoff catastrophe where every second and every foot of altitude matter and the airplane simply never achieves a stable climb. To understand what happened, we need to talk about the airplane itself. This was a McDonnell Douglas MD-11F tail number, November 259 Uniform Papa built back in 1991. It started life as a passenger aircraft and was later converted to a freighter, spending decades hauling people and then cargo around the world. By the night of the accident, this airframe had a long service history behind it, and like any older widebody, that history matters. The MD-11 is a tri-jet. If you look at it from the side, you'll see three engines, engine number one under the left wing, engine number three under the right wing, and engine number two mounted in the tail. That configuration made sense in its era, and today it makes the MD-11 a workhorse for cargo companies. It can lift a lot of weight a long way, and it's a familiar machine to many freighter crews. But as with any aging aircraft, maintenance becomes absolutely critical. In the months before this crash, this particular MD-11 reportedly underwent heavy maintenance in San Antonio. Technicians dealt with a crack in one of the fuel tanks and corrosion along structural beams, the kind of findings you do expect to some degree on a 30-plus year old airframe, but that you also treat with enormous seriousness. Repairs were made, the airplane returned to service, and it flew only a relatively short period before the accident. Now, we're not going to jump ahead of the investigators. It's too early to say this repair or that corrosion directly caused what happened. But as an old pilot, I can tell you this, an aging airframe that's just come out of heavy structural work is exactly the kind of airplane investigators are going to scrutinize. They'll pull maintenance records, interview technicians, and look very closely at whether fatigue repair quality or a hidden structural weakness played any role in the chain of events that followed. Now let's talk about the moment that changed everything, the failure and separation of engine number one. Evidence from the runway and the surrounding area shows fragments from that left engine and ultimately the engine itself separated from the wing. In some of the footage, you can actually see that by the time the aircraft is passing the camera, the left wing is engulfed in fire and the engine is simply gone. The MD-11 uses the General Electric CF680 C2 engine, a very common high bypass turbofan that has powered everything from Boeing 767 
to Airbus A300. Inside that engine are multiple stages of compressor and turbine blades, literally thousands of razor-sharp metal blades spinning at thousands of revolutions per minute. Under normal conditions, those blades live their entire life inside a very tough metal casing. But if one fails in an uncontained way, meaning it breaks apart and escapes that casing, the debris can behave like shrapnel from a bomb. It's too early in the investigation to say with certainty whether this was an uncontained failure, a pylon failure, or some combination of the two. But one likely scenario is this engine number one suffers a catastrophic failure, damaging the structure that holds it to the wing, the pylon, and the engine separates. As that engine comes apart, fragments shoot outward. Because of the way the engines sit under the fuselage, there is a fairly direct line from the left engine to the right engine, as well as the possibility of debris going under the belly, ricocheting off the ground, or even passing through the fuselage. From this angle, when we overlay a simple diagram, we can imagine that debris from engine number one reaches engine number three on the right wing. In the video, we see brief bright bursts of flame from that right engine, what we call compressor stalls. A compressor stall is essentially a breakdown of the smooth airflow inside the engine. The pressure waves can move forward instead of aft, causing bangs, flames out the back, and a sudden loss of thrust. Pilots train for single engine failures. A dual engine problem right as you leave the ground at max weight is a totally different level of emergency. So now connect the chain, the left engine fails, and separates dumping fuel in a fireball along the runway edge. In the same sequence, the right engine begins to stall, losing some or even most of its usable thrust. The tail engine number two may still be working, but it is now trying to lift a fully loaded MD-11 on its own. Thrust drops dramatically, lift drops with it. The airplane starts to mush through the air instead of climbing. At this point, no matter how well trained and experienced the crew is, they are fighting physics and a crippled airplane with almost no altitude to spare. Inside the cockpit, the sequence unfolds in less than a minute. According to the cockpit voice recorder, the CVR about 37 seconds after the takeoff roll began, a repeating bell starts sounding. It keeps going right up to the end of the recording. For pilots, that sound means one thing, multiple master cautions. In those few seconds, every instinct and every ounce of training kicks in. Imagine what the crew sees master caution lights flashing the left side of the cockpit glowing red from the fire outside engine instruments spiking and dropping the airframe, shuddering under asymmetric thrust. The captain's focus narrows to keeping the wings level and trying to climb. The first officer calls rotate. The captain pulls gently on the yoke just as trained and the nose lifts. But instead of accelerating upward, the aircraft hesitates. It's flying, but only just. With one engine gone completely, and the other barely producing power, there's almost no excess thrust. At that weight, a single remaining engine, the tail-mounted number two, simply can't carry them. The aircraft begins to yaw left as asymmetric thrust pulls the nose around. The crew is fighting it with full rudder input, but at low altitude there's no room to recover. They're out of power, out of lift, and out of time. Every pilot watching this knows what that feels like, the instinct to climb the disbelief when the aircraft won't respond the fight to save it anyway. These three professionals did everything they could in those seconds, and it's clear from the data and the flight path that they never stopped trying. When the MD-11 struck the ground, it hit a line of warehouses and a fuel recycling facility just beyond the runway perimeter. The fireball that followed could be seen for miles. Flames tore through the buildings and several were completely destroyed. The debris field stretched for nearly half a mile. First responders described the scene as apocalyptic. Louisville Metro officials immediately issued a shelter-in-place order within a five-mile radius. Roads were closed and people living nearby were told to stay indoors because of thick black smoke and possible chemical contamination from the burning fuel and plastics. Dozens were injured and multiple lives were lost on the ground. Families, workers, and bystanders caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. But the impact didn't stop there. For UPS, this was more than a tragic loss. It was a logistical shockwave. The company temporarily grounded its entire MD-11 fleet, roughly 9% of its aircraft. FedEx Express soon followed with its own grounding of similar jets, another 4% of the global freighter capacity. The FAA quickly issued an emergency airworthiness directive ordering inspections of all MD-11 engine pylons and mounts before further flight. For a few days, major supply chains slowed dramatically. 
Shipments stalled overnight deliveries missed their marks and airports around the country scrambled to reroute cargo through other hubs. It's a sobering reminder that aviation accidents don't just affect those on board, they ripple through economies, industries, and entire cities. As of now, the NTSB has recovered both flight recorders, the separated engine, and key pieces of the left wing and pylon assembly. Their full investigation could take a year or more. But even at this stage, several critical questions are guiding their work. First, what actually caused engine number one to separate? Was it a pylon structural failure, a maintenance issue, or an uncontained engine explosion that tore the mount apart? Second, how much collateral damage did that failure cause to engine number three on the opposite wing? We've seen video evidence of compressor stalls, but investigators will use detailed metallurgical analysis to confirm whether debris truly crossed the fuselage. Then there's the question of design. The MD-11 is a capable aircraft, but it's also complex and aging. Tri-jets have fallen out of favor for a reason. More engines mean more potential failure points and more maintenance challenges. The FAA and manufacturers will almost certainly review inspection intervals, corrosion control standards, and pylon fatigue assessments across the entire MD-11 fleet. And finally, there's the human side. Every pilot watching this will think about takeoff performance, about V1 decisions, about what they would do if the unthinkable happened just past that point of no return. This crash forces us to re-examine the assumptions behind single-engine out certification and whether modern procedures adequately account for simultaneous or cascading failures. When the NTSB releases its factual report likely within the next 12 to 24 months, we may have to rethink how we view engine separation risk, especially on aging cargo fleets still flying long-haul routes every night. In the end, what happened over Louisville wasn't just a technical failure, it was a human tragedy. Three crew members doing their jobs and 11 people on the ground who never made it home. Families shattered a community scarred, and an industry once again reminded that no flight is routine. For the rest of us, it's a call to keep learning to understand what went wrong and to make sure it never happens again. Aviation is built on lessons written in heartbreak, and every lesson saves lives. I'll keep following this investigation closely, and when the next NTSB updates are released, I'll bring you every detail. Until then, stay curious, stay safe, and fly smart, my friends.